Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Adams State College faculty lecture. Tonight, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker. It's an interesting coincidence. Last week, uh, Dr. Crowther gave a talk in this very room on Darwin. Tonight, he's giving one on Abraham Lincoln. Does anyone know the connection between the two? American? No. <laughs> they were born on the same day. Not just the same day of the year, but the same day exactly. And this year we celebrate the 200th anniversary of both of their births, as well as some other anniversaries he talked about last week. So it's an interesting coincidence. This week he's also talking about... Both dead. Yeah. That's a good connection. I'm good with that. Um, Dr. Crowther is the chair of the History, Government, and Philosophy Department. He's been here at Adam State College for 22 years. And American history is his specialty. It's his field. So feel free to ask some really hard questions, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Ed Crowder. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Robert, for that generous introduction, and thank you all for coming out on uh, an early fall, which I hope is not a harbinger of the fearsome winter to come. As a uh, Robert indicated this has been a, a, a big year for people who are interested in the past and how it shapes the present. Uh, Lincoln and, and Darwin's uh, bicentennial of their birth and of course in the case of Darwin the uh, we're almost to the exactly the 150th, the sesquicentennial of the publication of On the Origin of Species. And so of the making of books there is no end. Adam Gottnick what a name, say that ten times backwards. Uh, turned out a book called Angels and Ages, which is a, he calls it a short book about Darwin, Lincoln, and modern life. And his um, sort of well-duh thesis was both of these men are very important and they used language extremely well. But because this was uh, something about Darwin and Lincoln, uh, I was responsible for reading this book cover to cover. Lori, who is here, can tell you that uh, 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 it's a, been an interesting year in the Lincoln scholarship field. Uh, I sometimes, with understanding, sometimes with amusement, and sometimes without and out irritation and wrath, uh, respond to people who say, boy, it must be great being a historian once you kind of get it down, you're done for the rest of your life, and you just tell the same stories. Um, I got this Journal of American History on Thursday. I read, it is the Journal of American History, the Abraham Lincoln at 200, all about Lincoln. So I sat down Thursday night and went through this thing because I'm responsible for everything that's in it. And I even worked a, an essay in here that I thought was brilliant into the talk. Uh, not that you would care to feel sorry for me, I'm just doing my job. But as I say, this has been a big year in Lincoln scholarship. Weighing in at 11 and a half pounds and over 2,000 pages, the long-awaited uh, biography of Lincoln by one of the foremost Lincoln scholars of all time, Michael Burlingame, and uh, there it is. Uh, yeah, it uh, $123, though now it's come down significantly, and I'll bet you can find this at a secondhand bookstore sometime. And the truth is, uh, I, I made it halfway through the first volume and then read topically in the second volume on race, slavery, emancipation, and then another hobby of mine, Lincoln is commander in chief. It's been a big year for Lincoln. Uh, in Colorado, we, as we have throughout the nation, there's the Lincoln Bicentennial Commission that's been putting on a number of uh, different types of programs, everything from podcast to PBS uh, uh, television uh, series. And I had the good fortune to be one of the members in Colorado on the Colorado Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, which means that you spend some time going out and give talks to um, a lot of half-empty rooms. and. Uh, but that's okay because it's your job, and in the case of Lincoln, it's a, it's a good job. 
This is one of the big questions about Lincoln. Because of Lincoln's place in what scholars call memory, how the past is utilized in the present, figuring out what to do with a protean, complex, uh, widely uh, recorded figure like Lincoln on these kinds of topics, race and slavery. Uh, it's a big deal. And of course Lincoln says things that to 21st century readers who are not professional historians or not scholars of the 19th century, uh, it's problematic. And so what do you do when you assign uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates to a diverse population in one of our public schools and they read some things that are, came out of Lincoln's mouth that might tend to uh, shake the notion of Lincoln as the great emancipator or Lincoln as a person worthy of emulation. That is, when you encounter the record of the past, there are a lot of things about it that uh, shake you up. And that's one of the wonderful things from my perspective about being an historian. It's one of the challenging things if we expect the past to be neat and sequential and to conform with all of our expectations and projections onto the past about the way things should have been. So in the case of Lincoln and the question of Lincoln and race and slavery, there are a number of important questions that come up. Lincoln says there's just no way around it. As a modern reader reading the Lincoln-Douglas debates or other things that Lincoln said to people even when he was president, he says some things that would reasonably lead someone to conclude logically using our 21st century approach to things that Lincoln was a typical 19th century white racist. And so coming to terms with what those documents might mean in a historical sense is very important. This is part of the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates in the late summer and early fall of 1858. And this is what Lincoln said. There's no doubt that he says this. He said there's no way African Americans and white people can live together as long as the two races, to use his 19th century understanding, are side by side, one will be superior, the other inferior. And he's self-interested enough to say, I'm in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. There's absolutely no doubt Lincoln said it, and he meant exactly what he said. Now what he meant, well that's another piece. That's why historians make the big bucks. <laughs> Lincoln very late abandoned an idea that is as old as at least as the American Revolution. That is, were the great scourge of slavery to be brought to an end, what would happen with the formerly enslaved African American population? And an answer that took organizational expression with the formation, with its formation in 1816 of the American Colonization Society, the idea was to ship former slaves back to Africa. This is where the African country of Liberia comes from. Lincoln, throughout his uh, days, uh, utilized the notion of colonization, perhaps believed in it at one point. He certainly is speaking the colonization language as late as 1862, right? So at the time that he's a approaching uh, the permanent Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, he's still talking about whether African Americans should be uh, sent somewhere outside the United States should slavery as a result of the United States Civil War be brought to an end. We'll spend a little time talking specifically about this, but 
just before, a little over a month before Lincoln announced the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation on 22 September 1862, Lincoln met with a delegation of ministers in the White House, African American ministers, and this is what he said. He says, you know, I've got a great place for you guys to go live not in the United States. And uh, it's really going to suit you well. It's a warm place. You're going to like it a lot. Now the African Americans weren't especially thrilled with this. There's no doubt that Lincoln said this right as he is considering the Emancipation Proclamation. So if you were um, going to uh, read the Lincoln surviving massive documentary record of Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln the president, you're going to encounter this stuff and he did say this stuff and he did write this stuff. Now of course historians have been grappling with with Lincoln, the real Lincoln, really since he, uh, uh, s since he died. And historians have um, tried to make arguments about the meaning. What did Lincoln mean? Was he a racist? Uh, did, he, did he really believe that African Americans and, and, and white Americans could not live in the same country? And so if we look at the scholarship, what, what historians uh, have said about Lincoln, some say, some, not most, certainly not all, but some say, forget the great emancipator, Lincoln is really the great enslaver. And of course, it's a Mississippian who says this. Lerone Bennett, who is from Clarksdale, Mississippi, he was born there when my father was the superintendent of the white school system. You see, Mr. Bennett uh, is an African-American and a longtime writer for Ebony Magazine. And his first sort of foray into this, in 1968, he published an essay, uh, Was Lincoln Racist in Ebony? You can look it up, Google it on the web, and you'll see that it made a splash worldwide. And later, he refined his argument into a widely selling book that appeared less than a decade ago called Forced Into Greatness. The notion being, if Lincoln had his druthers, uh, slavery would have persisted in the South. Uh, people, former slaves who became free would have been shipped off somewhere and it was only the self-emancipation by the slaves and the vicissitudes of war that led Lincoln to be seen as the great emancipator. So this is one view that some adhere to. And here's Lerone Bennett. This picture is about five years old, but uh, a very passionate, uh, passionate speaker. And he says, you know, it was a real shock growing up in an African-American household where Lincoln, if you went into an African-American household and there were pictures on the wall, uh, this would be in the 1920s and 30s, there might be a picture of Jesus praying in Gethsemane on the wall, and there would be a picture of Abraham Lincoln. And when Bennett, who was brought up in the tradition as an African American to believe in the Lincoln image as the great emancipator, when he encounters what Lincoln actually wrote and said, as he would say, he's, he, he's on, on the PBS video looking for Lincoln, he said, I'm, everything I had heard about Abraham Lincoln, he says, was a lie. And this is what led him to make this particular argument. But of course, there are alternative views. Henry Louis Gates, remember him? He was in the news this summer, uh, not in a way that he particularly liked, but he got to have a beer with the president and the white cop who arrested him. I mean, hey, it doesn't get any better than this. Henry Louis Gates is an African American who was born in West Virginia, which in many ways is sort of Alabama in the north. Uh, he's a scholar of literature. His scholarship, um, uh, particularly on how African American young men use language, very important in the 1980s and 90s. And so he says, look, Lincoln was not the black man's friend. He was the white man's friend, and he was the friend of a united United States. But in order for things to work out like they did, right, Lincoln had to appeal 
to a very racist uh, electorate in the North. Right? We often forget that uh, you know, the, the, the northern states had uh, laws that looked like Jim Crow and that African Americans uh, fared very poorly in the so-called free states. Uh, New York didn't abolish slavery until 1827. There were still people in New Jersey who were African American who were considered apprentices for life in 1860. Right? And so you have this opinion that Lincoln has to appeal to to get elected to save the Union. He has to appeal to this uh, element in the electorate in order to emancipate the slaves. And here's an interesting thesis. We'll see more of this. Eventually Lincoln's going to meet Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass is going to change Lincoln's life. Lincoln, it's interesting, Lincoln did not have a whole lot of first-hand experience with African Americans prior to coming in to the office of the presidency. Relatively limited. And so meeting Douglas was a big, big deal. And so Lincoln is sort of this, this uh, uh, political operator who certainly has deep convictions, but he's got to say and do things in a certain way. And other people like Frederick Douglass could give the famous speech in Rochester, New York in July the 4th, 1852 and says, you know, what is the 4th of, Ju of July to the slave? It's nothing. The United States is a nation of hypocrisy and hypocrites. And Douglas can make those statements. Lincoln could not and hope to be elected to uh, uh, national office. There's uh, Skip Gates, Henry Louis Gates, and uh, it's really fascinating. One of the things when I was thinking about this talk, I got to watch um, Henry Louis Gates narrate uh, a film about Lincoln and race. I got to read his book on Lincoln, race, and slavery. And it's interesting that a PhD scholar of literature who was African American encountered the sort of racist things that Lincoln said and was really bothered by them. He really had to grapple with this, which suggested to me that if someone as learned as Skip Gates might not have read the Lincoln-Douglas debates and might not have read Lincoln's correspondence during the Civil War about the use of African-American troops or about colonization, uh, they might find what he wrote and said rather off-putting. Right? if you see it for the first time. For the historians, making sense of the 19th century and of Lincoln is, is sort of standard fare. And so the dominant school of what historians call historiography, which is sort of the systematic arrangement of arguments made by historians and their relative merit. In the historiography, this is the dominant view, what we call the two Lincolns. Lincoln was a guy who truly truly detested slavery. As he wrote as a young man, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. He truly detests slavery for a welter of reasons. But he continues to be this kind of 19th century white supremacist until some things happen. Right? He loses a, a child in 1862, in February 1862, when the war is going badly. And then he meets Frederick Douglass, who sort of says, you know, Mr. Lincoln, you have an opportunity if you'll grab it. You're going to lose this war if you don't move on slavery and get rid of it. You have an opportunity to do something for black people that will help you do your ultimate goal, which is to restore the Union. And so Lincoln sort of morphs, he transmogrifies from this Lincoln of the 1850s into this uh, transcendent figure uh, uh, by the end of the Civil War. Um, Oh well, uh, that's what the historians have said, and some have said it brilliantly. Uh, Michael Burlingame falls into this group. And of the Lincoln Bicentennial one-volume biographies, Ronald White's bi biography falls into this group. Ronald White is the best expositor of Lincoln's second inaugural address, which is simply the greatest 
writing done by a white person in uh, the United States. It's absolutely a phenomenal thing. And White emphasizes that something had happened. The Lincoln of 1861 could not have had these important, powerful, prophetic thoughts that he expresses in the second inaugural. Uh, and so these are two books very well worth reading. And they follow this basic line of interpretation called the two Lincolns. There's Mike Burlingame, who's now in Illinois with the Lincoln Museum, but he taught for years and years in Connecticut, and of course Ronald White, and uh, naturally two Caucasian uh, scholars. Whoopie do, you know, Lincoln's dead, most of you aren't going to read these books. Why does it matter that we get Lincoln right? It's not getting right with Lincoln, it's getting Lincoln right. Who was Lincoln? And what did he really mean with all of this stuff that he said and wrote? I think this is a real strong piece. Lincoln compared to some 19th century white people is relatively unspectacular on the issue of race. People like William Lloyd Garrison are racial egalitarians and Lincoln is not. And so you can't say, well, you know, we need to remember that everybody was a racist in the 19th century. That isn't true. Many, maybe most, but not all. And so Lincoln had options, and he pursued a particular course. And so the two Lincolns approach really doesn't get at this question of what Lincoln said and did and why he did it. But the new uh, two Lincoln orthodoxy sort of sometimes as an impediment to assessing uh, really what Lincoln meant and what he said. So here's my argument, and I'd like to say it's all mine, but I've been heavily introduced by, uh, influenced by people that I'm going to talk about. James Oakes, da the late David Herbert Donald, whose death in, in May was a huge loss to the historical profession. He's from Goodman, Mississippi, by the way, Professor Donald, and ended up at Harvard uh, and just one of those things. But Lincoln was a lawyer and he was a politician. And the reason that I say this is this is what Lincoln said about himself. So if we're going to try to understand what Lincoln meant about race and slavery when he spoke and when he wrote, uh, we want to take his words seriously. I want to take his self-identification seriously. He's a lawyer and a politician, but don't let those labels fool you, right? And so people who want to look at what Lincoln wrote at a particular time and expect to find the prophetic voice of the second inaugural way back in his Lyceum address that he gives in, the 18, uh, in 1842, they're going to be very disappointed right? Lincoln got one shot at the second inaugural after a traumatic experience called the American Civil War and he had had plenty of time to think about these prophetic themes but most of the time he's arguing cases uh, he's in a challenging marriage to say the least he buries two sons he's got a lot going on and so here's the piece he says and does things often for instrumental reasons which isn't to say that he doesn't have deep core values it just means that on a day-to-day -day basis he does what he needs to do in order to move through the day. There is absolutely no doubt that Lincoln took this notion very seriously. Lincoln believed, for example, that the Constitution is not only the supreme law of the land, but in his view of the Constitution, secession was illegal, and he had a paramount duty to restore the Union. So if we like Lincoln, the winning commander-in-chief, we have to accept that Lincoln arrives at that position because of how he values the Constitution. And here's the piece. The abolitionists don't make this up. The Constitution of the United States made the federal government primarily responsible with returning runaway slaves. And so 
That's in, uh, you know, forget about the re all the other elements. Oh, it refers to other persons. It doesn't refer to slavery. It makes the national government, in a time of limited national government, responsible for protecting slavery. So if Lincoln reveres the Constitution, which he does, if revering the Constitution compels Lincoln to seek the restoration of the Union and returning the southern states to a proper relation with the national government, if you like that part, you have to take the whole Constitution as Lincoln understood it, which is one of the reasons he's very reticent between the time he's nominated as the Republican Party nominee in the summer of 1860 to the time he takes office in March of 1861. He's very reticent on this uh, question of, 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 of slavery where it exists. He says, look, I'm going to leave slavery alone because it's constitutionally protected. But he also says, I'm going to keep it out of the territories, right? which is a hugely uh, explosive statement for, for Lincoln to have made. And here's the deal. He's got to run for office. And so I, I, I joke sometimes with my own students. I say, you know, years ago I used to give talks about uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew Jackson, and there was some dispute about exactly where he was born on the North and South Carolina border. And so in South Carolina, he's a South Carolinian. Right? If I'm in North Carolina, he's probably a North Carolinian. People mute their message often to appeal to particular constituencies, and Lincoln, of course, has to do this. Remember, Lincoln is mostly being condemned by the Lerone Bennett's of the world for his public utterances in a political context. Just uh, one of those things. Here's the other thing about Lincoln. Constitution clearly protects slavery. I'm going to show you where Lincoln, when he finally is president, really, really pushes the bounds of the Constitution to deal both with restoring the Union and with eradicating slavery. He just maybe didn't do it the way some people want. This is what Lincoln does. It's the core of the argument, right? I'm going to show you a document that illustrates this point. But here's the skinny of it. Unlike most 19th century white people, Abraham Lincoln was willing to um, apply the idea and ideals of the Declaration of Independence to African Americans. He does this consistently even when he's running for office and it's huge. Today it might surprise you how poorly the Declaration of Independence fared in the minds of people like Stephen Douglas that say it only applies to white people because blacks are not capable of self-government and to the people that I've written about, these southern planters who think the notion of equality Quality is plain silly. Lincoln sees the Declaration of Independence much like Doc, Dr. King would identify the Declaration of Independence as a kind of a national creed and he believes that in matters of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness it applies to African Americans. He says this consistently and it is just short of revolutionary that he says this. So way ahead of most white opinion on this point and I've got a, 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 a little document to show you. Uh, there. Um, he's able to use the notion of the natural right for a worker to enjoy the fruit of their own labor, something that inherently impeaches slavery. He's able to take this free labor argument and craft it into a kind of political message that is politically acceptable to northern white racist voters, while at the same time it absolutely, if true, makes slavery an institution that is inconsistent with natural rights philosophy. That's not a small achievement, right? You create an argument that the enemies of black people and black equality are going to embrace for their own self-interest because it resonates with their own sort of common sense. That's, if not revolutionary, awfully close to it. Uh, 
This is incredible. The Constitution protects slavery. But the Constitution also says the President of the United States is Commander-in-Chief, and he used his war powers right, uh, to move directly against slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation, for example, is, is justified as a policy because of the emergency that Lincoln is suppressing with military means because the southern secession couldn't be handled as a kind of police action and so he's going to confiscate billions of dollars of legal property through emancipation because he's commander-in-chief. No president prior to this time had made that expansive use of war powers. So that's a pretty powerful thing uh, if you think about it. Let's talk about this one. I showed you this piece earlier. The speech in 1862. I have to tell you one of the delights about doing the job that I'm supposed to do is I get an opportunity to learn lots of new things. I had never read the, the, the record of the encounter of Lincoln with African American clergymen in August of 1864 in my life. I just never read it. i would read about it. I'd never read the documents themselves. One of the cool things all of the major Lincoln collections are available online. The, uh, the standard Basler uh, collection, as well as the Robert Todd Lincoln manuscripts, which in their microfilm version were 93 reels of microfilm. We have them in the library. Right? But now they're online and they're searchable. This is something, this is what I think Lincoln did, and I, I will tell you that I'm stealing part of this idea from a brilliant historian at Princeton University named Sean Willens. When Lincoln met with delegations, most of the time, unless he was really really, really mad at George McClellan. When he met with delegations most of the time, the people who Lincoln were, was meeting with did almost all the talking. They would, Mr. Lincoln, this, 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 this. When Lincoln met with Frederick Douglass, he let Frederick Douglass do all the talking. When Lincoln meets with these African American ministers, he does all the talking. I wonder if there's a reason for this. Did he suddenly wake up and say, I'm in love with the sound of my own voice? Or would a politician and a lawyer have a purpose in shaping the conduct of a meeting? No, that couldn't be it, right? That'd be like an administrator waking up and doing something reasonable. That's not <laughs> going to happen. Look at Lincoln's audience. African-American ministers who are going to go immediately and talk to the black press. That is, the full conduct of this meeting, its content, is going to be out there, and that's exactly what happened within a day of this meeting's taking place. But who do you think the audience might be? For Lincoln telling a bunch of black guys that he wants to ship them to Central America. White people. Right? He wants this out there, because what's he thinking about? Thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation. He's got to have some cover, right? So he does this. Does that make him a, a monster? I'm certainly not going to make that argument. Uh, in uh, George M. Fredrickson, the late Professor Fredrickson's uh, words, uh, is he sort of being inconsistent? Well, perhaps. But of course, if you read what he actually says to the ministers, he's just floating a trial balloon. He never says, really, I'm actually going to do this. He says, I'm thinking about doing this, and you guys are going to love it if I do it. Of course, I hadn't said I'm going to do it. He's shaping the context in which a hugely important public policy is going to take place in the midst of the biggest national emergency in the history of the United States of America. That's pretty good. And then this is my personal, my, my favorite. I love this, how politics gets made. It's all about who gets to be postmaster in towns in Indiana in a particular congressional district. 
As late as August of 1864, Abraham Lincoln believed he would lose the presidential election of 1864. And thanks to people like Phil Sheridan and William Tecumseh Sherman, it didn't work out that way. But in the end, while Lincoln's victory totals about 55% to 45% is very impressive, when we break it down county by county, voting district by voting district, it's a near run thing, this 1864 presidential election. But Lincoln's able to run as the savior of the union and with the political capital that he has, he uses his political capital with the sort of post-election bounce to push the Senate, the House of Representatives on the 13th Amendment. And he gets right down to trading patronage for votes. So when you think about all the things that he could have used his energy on, that he does it to end slavery forever, everywhere in the United States, I think that's pretty telling. So there it is. Um, here's something else because it doesn't work this, it doesn't work out. But Lincoln had a view for the reconstructed South that would be over, uh, overturned by the caprice of events, by a fatal case of lead poisoning, by John Wilkes Booth and by Andrew Johnson and by my white uh, progenitors in the Deep South. Lincoln believed that, and this is going to represent a shift in his views from the 1850s, that African Americans would need to have certain kinds of rights, particularly the right to vote, if they were going to be able to give actuality to, give effect to, make the promise of the 13th Amendment robust. And so he pushed for this in a hugely challenging political context, the era of wartime reconstruction. The state to study, and it's the most studied state in reconstruction, is the state of Louisiana. And Lincoln pushes the wartime governor there, Michael Hahn, who's actually from Bavaria. He's this big German guy, Michael Hahn. Yeah. He says, you know, if you can do this, but he realizes this is politically volatile. But I mean, the piece is he really uh, is trying particularly to get the soldier, Union soldiers, um, the African American Union soldiers to have the, the right to vote. This is one of the more famous parts of the Lincoln-Douglas uh, debates, in which Lincoln comes off sounding like, well, ambivalent, unless you know what Lincoln is really arguing about. We talked about this earlier, right? He believes the natural rights life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, really the right to enjoy the fruit of your own labor, apply to African Americans as well as to white Americans. And in this view, Lincoln is initially, when he articulates this view, very much in the minority. But he's able to convince northern working class whites that slavery is a threat to free labor, and that makes this, this go. So, but then he goes on down and he says, you know, I'm not sure that in other ways African Americans are equal. And then he says this, I, I've not been in favor of making voters of jurors or whatever, allowing them to have um, certain rights that are creatures of state law. That is outside of the bounds of the national government. So on the one level, you extend this huge notion of natural law, the rights, equality under natural law, like gravity, to African Americans. And then you say, well, maybe not here. And I want you to think about this. Do children vote? They're citizens. Women? They're citizens, but don't vote. And so. In Lincoln's time, this concession to state law is at the lowest level. 
Elsewhere in the speech, Lincoln is going to say, I believe that African Americans are entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizen. Not only saying African Americans by virtue of being born here and in defiance of the Dred Scott decision are citizens, they enjoy citizenship rights like trial by jury. So he absolutely, right, natural rights, citizenship rights, and for Lincoln in this construct, this is a lesser third thing, and this is where he's going to change his mind by 1865, right? So in the 1850s, he's already extended two levels of uh, the sort of construction of equality to African Americans in an unprecedented way withholding the third, the kinds of things that state governments do, and later he's going to push the envelope there, particularly in the question of voting. So uh, it's no wonder that Southern whites during the Civil War really are afraid of Lincoln on race and slavery. They see him as close to revolutionary, even if sometimes contemporary scholars in our own day get caught up in what Lincoln isn't extending and forget how robust what he is extending really might be. This is a Lincoln's letter to Michael Hahn, and uh, you can he would give you the citation there in the Roy P. Basler edition of Lincoln's Collected Works. I bought mine at a secondhand bookstore. Now it's free, online, and fully searchable. Oh well. But this is what he said. He said, look, slavery's done. And by the way, Mike, my at-will appointee, Mike, Mike, if you can do this, work with the people in New Orleans and see if we can't do something about African American voting. This is what he's working on right at the, as, as, uh, at the beginning of uh, what we call the Overland Campaign in the Civil War with Grant fighting Lee and then the invasion up the Red River. There's the southern part of Louisiana that's been in Union hands for about two years, coming up on two years in April. Uh, uh, 1864. And so Lincoln is really trying with these sort of temporary civilian enterprises where the Union controls parts of the Confederate States, trying to get African American voting into the mix. And of course, a year from now, he's going to be very much, um, he'll be a month away from being dead. So the idea is, is that they're really not two Lincolns. He was as egalitarian as nearly uh, as, as it was possible to be in the 1850s and in the 1860s. And when he has political power, he does some rather robust, important things, particularly the 13th Amendment. Remember, Lincoln is one person. Right? He is the president. But there are lots of opinions that get to shape what happens to African Americans, on, or particularly on the question of political equality. And most of those people uh, are people that were wearing gray uniforms during the Civil War. Uh, historians, I guess, love books. It's, it's what we do in, instead of having wallpaper, we have books. But. Um, uh, Books, uh, essays and books worth reading. Um, this is, I stole a lot of stuff from, from, uh, from Jim Oakes, but Eric Foner has a wonderful essay on Lincoln and the colonization question that is brilliant. And they appear in a book that came out almost a year ago called Our Lincoln. It's a set of thematic essays that are pretty easy to read that are written by particular specialists uh, uh, on uh, you know, Richard Cowardine, who's this eminent scholar of 19th century religion, writes the essay on Lincoln and religion. Uh, because this is hot in scholarship, there's something about Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and that relationship that's really important. Frederick Douglass, in many ways, is going to create the, the, the great emancipator image. In 1872, African Americans raise money for, erect, 
It the, was the first slide, a statue to Lincoln. And Douglas is going to give a speech dedicating that statue where he says, you know, my late friend Lincoln was really right on race and slavery. Now if you think about this, this is Douglas, a contemporary, who in 1872 thinks, boy, Lincoln really was our guy. And so I, I, I kind of wonder, I mean, I guess what are we going to say about Frederick Douglass? He's a sellout to his race? I, uh, no evidence for that. I don't think so. Um, this summer in the New Republic, Sean Willits reviewed a lot of the scholarship that's been pouring forth, uh, uh, maybe vomiting forth out of the press. There have been just so much stuff, a lot of it good, some of it awful on Lincoln. And, and his uh, searing, I, I don't know that Willens can do something that isn't searing, but his searing essay in the New Republic, and this is, you think about this in a, a, a magazine, this is a giant essay, very, very much worth reading. And so uh, here they, they are. This is Eric Foner's Iron Lincoln, David Herbert Donald's masterpiece uh, that came out in the mid-90s. Uh, Donald was the first of the Lincoln scholars to begin to put back in the primitive era of word processing, he would have his assistants enter in Lincoln documents into very primitive word processing equipment so that you could search the text. He was the first guy to do this, and uh, there he is. Uh, Jim Oakes, who uh, teaches in New York City uh, at, the, at the Graduate Center there, uh, uh, the Radical and the Republican, really, really good work. And of course, Matthew Pinkster, who was David Herbert Donald's last doctoral student. Donald trained many. Pinkster was the last. And for the uh, sort of bicentennial issue, he had to write this huge article on all the Lincoln scholarship. I thought it was marvelous. And so uh, he, 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 makes, he makes, uh, makes the talk because uh, uh, there he is. Um, 18 feet tall, and uh, there's a reason he's 18 feet tall, because it's half 36, which is the number of states in the United States in 1865. You have to know these things, right? You really do. Uh, but, you know, there, there is the sort of marble Lincoln, and we kind of, sometimes we like Lincoln the symbol. I would suggest that Lincoln the human being is eminently, more interesting than even this masterful 18-foot uh, 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 statue of Mr. Lincoln. So, I've talked enough. Questions, comments, Lincoln race and slavery, Lincoln himself, anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> Yes. Uh, you touched upon uh, Lincoln's statement. I believe it was in his inaugural address about you know not affecting slavery. Where it already is. Right. I'm sorry. To me, that's a man of compromise. To me, that's not yeah. a man that has made a lifelong commitment to, to abolish slavery. And I know you, you touched on the fact that it was in the Constitution to to uh, you know, catch runaway slaves. And, and I, I'm sorry. I just I just view him as a man of compromise. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that the challenge would be that then what would you think about a person who says, I think the Constitution protects slavery, I'm going to place my hand on the Bible to defend the Constitution. I think it's a tough thing. And I think we would really like Lincoln to do things that we wish we could do or that we wish he had done in a way that makes that, that makes sense, but if, uh, if uh, you know, if Lincoln moved against slavery where it was, where it existed, there's no way the Union would have prevailed in the Civil War. Four Union states have the institution of slavery, and as Lincoln would say, he hoped in this coming conflict to have God on his side, but he said, I must have Kentucky, and in the end, he moves very slowly against slavery and is able to keep Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and the Union. So, 
in some sense, he's got, a, he's got a lot of balls in the air. He's got to manage the secession crisis. Maybe the greatest achievement Lincoln did as president was holding the border. His decision to, to call for troops in April of, seven, uh, of, of, of 1861, his decision to call for troops to put down the rebellion in South Carolina had caused North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and Arkansas to secede. Something about slavery, and he probably loses the other slave states. And if you remember, New Jersey's electoral vote was split four to three. There's the possibility that lower New Jersey might have gone. I mean, so maybe he should. Maybe he should have done something else. But, uh, you know, historians looking at his decision-making process are, are caught in the fact that he's not operating in a vacuum. He's got the Civil War and, uh, and slavery is connected with that piece. You know? Yes? Great Britain's emancipation was like 30 some years before. Were there political and economic pressures on the states at that time affecting what we were doing? Of affecting, affecting um, the decisions that our, our states were going through. The biggest, the biggest impacts, and, and you know, let's, let's first talk about uh, emancipation. British emancipation affects the Caribbean, not India. It's compensated emancipation. It scares the bejeebers out of southern slaveholders very much so, and that affects national politics. And there's a, a you know, big concern with British abolitionism. In fact, the southern construction of abolitionism and British adventurism in the independent republic of Texas helped to bring on the annexation politics of Texas. So there's a, a, there, there's a huge multifaceted kind of uh, set of connections uh, with the British emancipation. And many of the, the sort of religious emancipationists are part of this sort of transatlantic evangelical community. And so there's a lot of, of push from British free trade anti-slavery, abolitionist evangelicals that affects the, the public discourse. And that also scares the living bejeebers out of the, uh, the sort of uh, slaveocracy uh, in, in the United States. Others, other stuff, good questions, comments. Yes? I see Lincoln as a man uh, a lot of compromise, but it just shows that if you know a man like that can change as it goes along, you know, we can all change to do the right thing. You know, he's, he's amazing, uh, an amazing story. The part about Lincoln, because uh, uh, that, that to me is, is why he holds a particular place in the sort of didactic telling of, of U.S. history. I mean, he really, now, now he, he hates his father. There's no, he, he never gets over his disdain for Thomas because he thinks Thomas, Thomas is sort of a negative role model. Thomas is a fatalist, except my, he accepts life as it comes. And Lincoln is fiercely ambitious, and he becomes upwardly mobile. He teaches himself Euclidean geometry. Right, no benefit. He attended approximately three months of formal schooling in his life, teaches himself Euclidean geometry so he can make better arguments as a lawyer, so he can think logically. When he becomes commander in chief, he realizes that he's not getting very good advice. And contrary to the late T. Harry Williams' uh, assessment that Lincoln was a great natural strategist, he taught himself the elements of military science and logistics uh, in, the, in the same way. And if the two Lincoln people have an, an argument to be made, his actual experience with black people Frederick Douglass, his actual experience sitting in the telegraph office getting the telegraph reports from the attack by the 54th Massachusetts at Battery Wagner in the summer of 1863, he has a lot of opportunity to move on the race question and it's clear that he's entertaining by the end of the Civil War the notion of voting and other kinds of rights. So yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, a, a, a neat thing about Lincoln is that you can find these examples of development and betterment, although they don't always cut in linear directions. How do you, you know, 
Lincoln sometimes almost is too ambitious. You know, it's like, God, this guy really wants to be somebody. And sometimes that doesn't set with our views about, oh, we'd like a person to be a little more mellow. Because he really does have the fire in the belly to move up and to make a mark. He really wants to be elected president, right? And, and yeah, self taught. Yeah, it's amazing. Yes? Two questions. Significance of Northern white labor's fear of emancipation. Yeah, I, you know the the piece is, and, and and there's a there's a there's a new book out by and I can't even remember Chandra Manning's married name, but it's called What the What This Cruel War Was Over, and she tries to make an argument that. You know, emancipation, uh, the northern labor, northern soldiers, man, they're into this emancipation from 1861 on. I don't think so. I think that's a real fear. Uh, so much of fear, a little story. Um, the first hardback edition of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, has in it one of these gripping tales called Eliza's Flight to Freedom. She's got, a, she's a, an enslaved woman. She's running for freedom. She's got her infant who she doesn't want to see grow, uh, grow up as a slave. And the dogs are chasing her and she jumps into the ice choked Ohio River. Now you read the text and she's described as a very dark African. She's whiter than I am in the illustration which suggests there's a real concern about, you know, what's going to happen. If, if we get rid of slavery, they're going to move up here and compete with us. And they're huge pockets, not just in the butternut regions of southern Ohio, but the, the laboring cl uh, class in, in, in New York City that, for a welter of reasons, are racist, and they're immigrants, and they don't want the economic competition. I mean, you know, when you think about it, um, most, uh, uh, Lincoln prevails in the Electoral College in 1860. Northern white working class voters do not, it's close, but most vote for other candidates in the 1860 election. When they become soldiers, things change. And when they realize that if we get rid of slavery, maybe the war will stop and we won't have to die. And oh, by the way, if we can recruit 200,000 African Americans to go get shot up by General Lee, uh, there's, a, there's a movement there too. And one of the great sort of um, lost opportunities is there's no one to direct that northern uh, multifaceted anti-slavery kind of sentiment into an effective reconstruction once Lincoln's assassinated. You know, that's the sort of what if Lincoln had lived. So that's one. What's the other? He has some early losses in early on, what was his position on slavery? He, he was always against slavery. There, there's a, er, early on, Thomas sent him down to New Orleans, and this was his first uh, experience. He, he took a, a flatboat uh, of goods down to New Orleans and then walked back um, uh, uh, to, to Indiana. And, and he despised slavery. And here's the piece about his father. You know what Thomas would do with Abraham Lincoln's money? He'd take it. And Lincoln viewed Thomas as, you know, that, that that was something that doesn't sit well. So, I mean, here's the piece about Lincoln and slavery. So much of it is driven by this notion of Lincoln's construction of right and wrong. Slavery's wrong not because of the racism in slavery, but because of this economic violation of natural law that could affect everybody. It affected young white Abraham Lincoln like it affected the slaves that he saw in the city of New Orleans when he was a youngster. So, yes. In an imaginary world that fixed the states before pre-Mexican War, it, are the issues big enough to have civil war? People thought there, that, that there, there was. There's a, there's a new book out by a, a brilliant historian at, uh, at Temple University, Elizabeth Barron. Um, and uh, read the footnotes. She says nice things about me. She's the only one. But <laughs> the book is entitled Disunion. And it, it looks at this question. There is a powerful 
current out there that goes back to the Constitutional Convention. And that is, if you move against slavery, Georgia and North Carolina are not going to ratify the Constitution. Agitation about those kinds of issues, and they do, uh, it, it, it does, uh, it, it does uh, percolate, um, is seen as threatening the Union so we don't talk about it. Even with that, Timothy Pickering, who had been a Secretary of War in the Adams Cabinet and leader of something called the Essex Junto in, in Massachusetts, literally wants to take uh, New England out of the Union because they fear the, uh, the diminishment of their political influence in an expansionist country moving west and also in a country with the three-fifths compromise that they construct as maximizing the voting power of southern slaveholding whites. It's a big issue. If you were taking the U.S. survey, they're actually reading a book by Matthew Mason on this issue in the early republic. To sort of make the Civil War easy to understand, we've tended to mute the debate about slavery in the 1780s forward and so we sort of talk about the Civil War with William Lloyd Garrison in 1831 so we can make a package but there are issues I don't know how you measure what could have happened but there were lots of people who thought that if we can't get you guys to shut up about these issues there will be secession and civil war and it will be a very bad thing and you can find documents from that from the time of the war of 1812 forward so yes Chuck. what if any influence did Mary Todd have on him with regard to her racial bias? I would say none um, and the, their marriage and their relationship is interesting. The new biography out by Catherine Clinton on Mrs. Lincoln, a fascinating figure. She clearly, she would have sort of the genteel upper south white woman views of slavery. Their inferior slavery is their natural condition and her husband absolutely disagrees with that view. And so, um, if anything, Mary Todd Lincoln's views and the Todd family may have muted Lincoln's understanding about how seriously the Deep South took the question of excluding slavery from the territories. So the influence might have gone in the other direction. Uh, another thing worth reading on the, on the marriage, it's a, a volume called The Insanity File uh, on, on Mary Todd uh, Lincoln, who's truly, I mean, there's such a thing as a tragic figure. She's a, she's a, a tragic figure. And, you know, your, your son tries to put you in the nut house. And when your lawyer tries to defend you, the state of Illinois passes a law that says a woman can't be a lawyer. And that case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says you're right. It was tough being Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, she was, her, her biggest impact on the perception of the Lincoln administration by northern unionist elements. She was a spendthrift, and all of her brothers are fighting down in Bubbadum. And that was an issue for Lincoln to have to finesse, so that's another another impact. Oh, here it is. Yes? I had two great-grandfathers that fought in the Civil War. One was a New Mexico guy and the other in the Colorado Cavalry. Uh, was the Lincoln fear that this area, Colorado was new in the state, that this area of the Southwest was, was still unstable after the Mexican-American War? There were. It could go and get fall into the hands of the Confederates? Yes. And the first thing that happens right away, absolutely right away, Jefferson Davis had made the Butterfield Overland Express route run through the south in the sort of U and then go back up to California. Lincoln makes it run across the route of I-80. He also uh, uh, causes the, the governor of California, because he has to answer the call for troops like in, uh, in the east, you have to raise troops and they're deployed specifically. The first California volunteers are sent to Los Angeles, which was an area where there was the fear that the local California population, having had ample reason not to like being in the United States, might use this as an opportunity to, to win 
withdraw uh, from the Union. Uh, he spends a fair amount of time uh, dealing with uh, ERS Canby, who's the commander down at Fort Craig, and it's mostly, I know you're outmanned and it's going to be a bad thing and we're doing what we can do. He actually holds up the deployment of troops when, uh, when the Texans invade New Mexico in 1862 that would have gone and fought at the Battle of Shiloh. So there, there is this piece. The state historian for the state of Colorado is a man named Bill Convery, and he's working on a piece and he's been giving a, a, a series of talks. Colorado was very much on Lincoln's mind. One of the last letters that he wrote was sent to a Coloradan about sort of the future in Colorado's role. So there is a concern. Historians today have a better awareness than Lincoln might have had because he's so focused on where he is, but he is paying attention to California. He is paying attention to Arizona and to uh, New Mexico and the, and the Colorado Territory. Colorado Territory sort of created in 1861 to kind of clean up administratively uh, the, 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 inter the Mountain West and the Southwest so you can administer um, its defense during the Civil War. The book on that subject to read is by Alvin Josephi called The Civil War in the American West. It's a marvelous, marvelous read. Uh, there's a, yes? Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert, but uh, uh, the, the, the number 36 is very important. 36 columns, right? Uh, uh, the, there are um, 36 steps, and so that was to represent, uh, and it's a powerful political statement. The construction of the monument says secession is illegitimate, it doesn't exist. How do we know? We built a monument to say that, like Lincoln said, these, uh, these states are in the Union. Uh, the statue here, and I think his name is John Charles French. Is the, is the artist here, and it's an attempt, this is a fascinating piece, to make the plain clothes Lincoln sort of Romanesque, sort of in that, uh, uh, that, that tradition of civic humanism, and so that's, that's uh, a, another, another element. One of the fascinating things today, if you go to Washington, D.C., you want to talk about an interesting symbolism, the Lee House which is on the Arlington Cemetery grounds, overlooks the backside of the, of the uh, memorial. And of course it was Postmaster General Montgomery Meigs who had lost his son in the Civil War that said, I'm going to start burying dead people here, right? And uh, the Lees will never want it back. <laughs> the, uh, here's something I should have mentioned and I just didn't, well, you could go on about this forever. Um, Coming back from Gettysburg in November 1863, Lincoln goes to Gettysburg, just himself and his valet, a man named William A. Smith. Coming back, Lincoln gets a cold. William A. Smith, who works for the Treasury Department, gets a severer cold. For a while, Lincoln is having the Treasury Department send money to William Smith, who's Lincoln's valet, uh, to the White House, and Lincoln is managing his affairs. William Smith dies. Lincoln has him buried in Arlington Cemetery. He's right up by the Lee House. The marker says, Lincoln picked the words, William A. Smith, citizen. William A. Smith was African American. So it's a, another one of those powerful symbolisms. So I, I'm not much of an expert on, I know where the marble came from, but, uh, and I know the number 36, and you have the, uh, that's about it. Okay. Yes. As as Grant was moving on Rich, uh, Richmond, Sherman's burning through the South. Lincoln got a premonition of success. How was he really going to reintegrate the South? I mean, what was yeah. his ultimate goal for for selling what he had spoken about? Now? One one of the areas where I think Lincoln was misinformed because reality was too hard to contemplate and where he probably didn't learn all that was available to learn from experience. Lincoln as a Republican believed that slavery is not only a bad thing 
for workers. It's not only a bad thing for uh, northern white workers, it's a bad thing for southern white workers. And so if we could just eliminate this conspiratorial minority of secessionist planter plutocrats, then the white people would be just like Lincoln. They're going to be upwardly mobile, value free labor, and lots of things are going to be possible. I don't know that today a historian reading about uh, uh, racism in, in the American South can do an adequate job with the benefit of hindsight. Lincoln clearly, he, he believed in something he called voluntary self-reconstruction. So on the 8th of December 1863 when he issues his proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction, he says that, you know, the famous 10% plan, if 10% of the eligible voters will just take an oath of allegiance, why only 10%? Well he thinks that the vast majority of Southerners are loyal United Statesians and, and, and they'll agree just, I don't think he could come to terms with the kind of racial antipathy where southern whites would trade poverty for a long time for white supremacy. So uh, yeah, that, that, it's, an, it's not a happy story. Uh, and, and I think Lincoln just, the book to read is uh, Eric Foner, Free Soul, Free Labor, Free Men, The Ideology of the Republican Party. And it looks at the kinds of ideas that Lincoln had about the South. And the South was seen as defective, but also redeemable. And Lincoln lived at a time when we had been able to talk voters out of booze. We were moving toward prohibition with the main law. Uh, ministers had talked backsliders like myself back into church. And the idea was if we just explained to Southern whites how they would benefit from free labor. Things would, would just right themselves. And it, and it didn't work that way. And, uh, you know, there are parts of, I mean, Reconstruction, that, that's, we love talking about Lincoln. Reconstruction is what we ought to talk about, and it's hard, and it's painful, and it's complex. There are whole parts of the South that were never militarily conquered. And there they said, we surrendered. I didn't. And from the very beginning, they resisted attempts by more moderate white Southerners uh, to enter into Reconstruction. And in the end, uh, they're, the, they're, the, they're the element that, that's going to win Reconstruction. You know, the Union prevails in the Civil War, and there's the 13th Amendment, and that's huge. The white South won Reconstruction, and it's not even close. Yes. Do you think the concept of defeat that the South has that no other real part, no other part of this nation really has, did that play a role? I mean, yeah, yeah. was it the racism or was it just bitter hatred of the North? It's, it's all of those things. There's all those things. There, there was a song that was sung, and I'll spare uh, the, the, this. I, I, I do this for my class. But the third verse of the, it's called I'm a, I'm a Good Old Rebel Soldier. And the third verse is uh, 300,000 Yankees lie still in southern dust. We got 300,000 before they conquered us. They died of southern fever, of southern steel and shot. But I wish it was three million instead of what we got. So there's a powerful element there. I mean, the White South, and you know, it's 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 easy for us today to to demonize the White South and to make the comparisons with Nazi Germany. The thing, and you've heard me say this, Mr. Texan, if you had lived in the 1860s in Mississippi, you would have acted like a Mississippian. They saw themselves as the true heirs to the American Revolution, practicing a social arrangement that is as old as the Old Testament. They see everybody else as being the ones that are departing from the ancient landmarks that their fathers have set up. And so there's a real resentment there. And then you add to it the defeat, and then you add to it the emancipation, and it's a hugely bitter pill. Although one of the great ironies, if you read the letters from the, the soldiers in the Army of Northern Virginia, when they surrender, when Lee surrenders the army in April 1865, they are prepared for dramatic change. Many think they're going to be marched off to prison camps. And it's 
the assassination of Lincoln and then the change of message by Andrew Johnston, or Johnson that emboldens these people then to try to reverse in reconstruction what they had lost on the battlefields in 1864. You know, so it's one of those things. Other stuff. <laughs> Let's take time for one more. Is okay. there one more question? <coughs> I think they've had it, well, then Robert. Let's thank our one more time. <laughs> Adams State College. Great stories begin here.